Hello and welcome to the ACT and NACT annual conference from wherever in the world that you're joining us. Our theme for this session is LIBOR transition. You should all be aware of the phasing out of LIBOR as a benchmark reference rate by the end of 2021. And there are several sessions during conference that will provide updates both from a bank and from a corporate perspective on the sorts of things that you need to be thinking about. But for the next 30 minutes, I'm delighted to say that I've been joined by a couple of central bankers to provide us with some thoughts from the official sector about the whys and wherefores of eyeball transition. Now, before we start, let me make some introductions. My name is Sarah Boyce, and after many years of working in corporate treasury, I am now a member of the policy and technical team at the Association of Corporate Treasurers. Um, let me turn first to David. David Bowman is a Senior Associate Director of the US Federal Reserve. David, perhaps you might like to start just by giving us a couple of minutes about your involvement in, in eyeball transition. Sure, and thank you for having me. Um, I have had the pleasure of being involved in the LIBOR transition since about 2012 or 2011. Um, and my roles, I have several different roles. Um, probably most importantly, I am the lead staff member interacting with the Alternative Reference Rates Committee here in the US, which is the national working group in charge of um, creating at least one path um, for LIBOR transition. In addition to that, though, I'm also the board's representative to the uh, FSB's official sector steering group. And so I get to work with uh, Al Hughes uh, at Fairmount and colleagues at FCA um, and Bank of England and throughout the globe trying to coordinate uh, the, the LIBOR transition as best we can and LIBOR transition. Thank, thank you, David. Um, and that needs to be nicely into Alistair. Alistair Hughes is Senior Advisor of the Market Director at the Bank of England. Um, Alistair, what's been your involvement in eyeball transition? Um, well, first of all, uh, thanks very much for um, uh, hosting this session and good to speak to everyone today. Um, I'm a relative rookie uh, compared to, uh, uh, so uh, I sit in the bank's markets directorate. We focus on market structure, which uh, the transition to risk-free rates is a key part. Um, within that role, I, I run the bank's team and coordinate the bank's work in that area. I also provide, my team provides support to the industry working group. Uh, we spend a lot of time working with both uh, banks, financial institutions, but also corporates, end users and trade associations to help the industry smooth its way through uh, the transition. Prior to that, I spent 20 years as a uh, banking supervisor, uh, mainly supervising large UK and US GCIP groups. Well, thank you very much indeed. Um, you've clearly both got an awful lot of relevant uh, experience when we're talking about transition. So let's move straight into some of the detail. Um, Alistair, perhaps you could start us off by taking a step back and just explaining why LIBOR is, is no longer appropriate? Yeah, absolutely. It's a great place to start. Um, transition is always difficult, is always difficult. And we know projects um, such as these can see more cost especially with so many of us working remotely um, at the moment. Um, that's why if you do only take one thing from the virtual room today, um, it, it'd be uh, important that the transition from LIBOR is both desirable, but it's also necessary. Um, it's not arbitrary. Uh, and um, you know those that think we can limp along with the current status quo are wrong. Um, that move away from LIBOR is necessary to deliver a stronger, more stable and transparent financial system, one that works for all market participants. Um, the properties of LIBOR um, are not hugely well understood quite often by, uh, by all uh, market users, but fundamentally the market that LIBOR seeks to measure just does not exist in the same way that it used to, and it's not sufficiently active to continue to support the rate. There's global agreement on this point across all the LIBOR jurisdictions, uh, the Financial Stability Board and the G20, um, and certainly there's no sign of, uh, of these markets upon which LIBOR are based changing. Um, banks have strengthened their balance sheets um, uh, and they're less reliant on the wholesale interbank funding markets um, that underpin LIBOR. Um, those markets uh, contributed to some of the issues we saw during the financial crisis and therefore the strength and liability structures we see in banks are incredibly important and I think we saw the benefit of that recently through COVID um, as the banks are able to continue to lend into the real economy. 
also that period of stress that, that we saw um, earlier this year in March and April um, um, further highlighted the fragility of the rate um, as central banks took policy action to support the economy. LIBOR rates, first of all, tracked those rates, but then they spiked upwards. Um, and those upward spikes, which, which directly impact uh, the coupons that borrowers pay, were based on very limited transactions. Uh, certainly, in some of the sterling measures based entirely on banks' expert judgments. Um, those low levels of activity make the rate fragile, and they also make it susceptible to liquidity and application effects, especially during those periods of stress. Borrowers should be exposed to robust uh, reference rates that are underpinned by real transactions, rather than being exposed to these market liquidity dynamics. That's why each of the LIBOR currencies has run a process to identify robust alternatives um, over the last few years. And the rates that have been selected by the market and they're being implemented by groups that comprise both the financial institutions, but also end users across the cash and derivative markets. But I'll pause there. Okay. No, that's that's really helpful. I always think it's useful to provide a bit of context to these conversations. Um, so, so that's the problem, David. Uh, can we talk a little bit about perhaps what the solution um, looks like? You know, we we hear a lot about we've got these new reference rates, RFRs, alternate reference rates coming. Uh, could you sort of pick the bones out of that a little for us, perhaps? Sure, um, and I would agree with what Al said. Um, the way I like to put it in terms of this is, um, I do believe this. I believe that LIBOR probably would have collapsed 10 years ago um, if the official sector had not uh, stepped in. Uh, and so it's not a question so much about whether it's desirable for LIBOR to continue or not. You know, LIBOR will stop. We don't know exactly when, but it will. And so this is something like, uh, you know, should there be a hurricane or should there be you know, a fire? Well, we all wish there wasn't a hurricane or we all wish there wasn't a fire. Um, but those aren't things you can, you can control. So, and LIBOR, the LIBOR stop is like that. Um, we can't make it not happen. We can only um, try to make sure that we come out of it safely. So when we began thinking about this, um, almost 10 years ago, looking at the dynamics that Al has laid out, that the market that LIBOR is meant to represent is now very thin. Even the dollar, which is you know perhaps the currency of most transactions, there are very few. Banks don't want to continue to submit. So we're, you know, we didn't know what the timing was, but we knew that LIBOR could stop. And we knew that people were not prepared for that. Um, and that was a process because you, you had to think, well, what, what would happen? Are people prepared for LIBOR stop now? What would happen if it just stopped today? Nothing good would have happened from that. Um, you know, what do you need to prepare? Well, you need some other rate that people can go to. At the time that we looked, there really was no other rate in dollar. And I think in many currencies, um, people had to go through and they thought, you know, there'd be more potential choices out there than at the end of the day there were. So, you know, in the US, we went through this process. Could you do this market? Well, gee, no, there's not that many transactions there. Could you do that market? No. Um, so as we looked at all of this, the only markets that were thick enough, um, deep enough, robust enough to support the hundreds of trillions of dollars that probably ill-advisedly had got glommed on the LIBOR were overnight rates markets. Um, you know, so in the U.S., we were looking at overnight unsecured markets, overnight secured markets. All of the national working groups, all of the central banks looking at this came to the same conclusion largely independently. The only markets that were um, robust enough for overnight markets. Um, you know, in the U.S., we had to go through a process. So uh, unlike in the U.K., where they were able to uh, uh, reform their Sonia market, um, we, at the end of the day, decided to go down um, probably a harder path, but I think a necessary one of producing an entirely new rate. Um, the Secured Overnight Financing Rate, or SOFR, based off U.S. overnight treasury repo markets, which are the largest rates market at a given tenor in the world. And so we had to go down that path. Um, it isn't an easy path. It is something new, and people don't like new things. Um, but it is a necessary one. Um, and so here, you know, we've been going, gone through that process um, of building those markets out. But again, we're doing it because it's unnecessary, because uh, there weren't really other alternatives out there that would be robust enough to withstand all the volume that had gone on the LIBOR. So that's how we approached it. 
And, and Al, was it a similar approach in, in the UK? Yes, okay, uh, an industry group selected Sonia and um, to use. I think the key things for people to know about Sonia is that it's based on strong underlying transactions. Uh, it's actually produced by the Bank of England via data we collect. And it's been produced in a way that ensures it's, it's sort of future proof and it's robust going forward. Actually, during that period of market stress, we actually saw the level of activity underpinning Sonia increase. Um, so when people use Sonia, uh, they can do so confidently knowing that it's based on actual transactions that are unpinning it. As we've said, in order to be robust, it has to be different than to understand these conventions as we move away. But certainly in the sterling markets, we've seen lots of people embrace the rate. Um, in the traded markets, about half the uh, short end flow in derivatives is now in Sonia. And we've seen corporates like National Express, um, so Smith Klein, uh, Riverside Housing Group, um, all access um, Sonia. So don't just take uh, our word for it. We're seeing actual corporates get out there and use these facilities, uh, including during this kind of period of stress. That's, that's really interesting and good to know, actually, that you're beginning to see some real take up of it. And I guess that leads us neatly into the next question, which is about timelines. Um, and when do we anticipate um, transition either to have been completed or, or the various uh, milestones through transition? Um, Al, are there any parts of the market that are actually sort of done? Are they? Uh, transition completely and and when do you expect to see everything transitioned by um well i think the the, the message on on the endpoint has been kind of clear and consistent um that libel can't be guaranteed past 2021 and therefore to the extent libel affects your business um you shouldn't ignore it you it's not going you should be ready for that point that said different markets different products different client groups will transition at, at, at different times and and our approach you know tries to reflect that and understand the challenges people have faced uh, i mean also overall i'd say you know the good news is there is there is time uh, to transition but you do need to start now you do need to engage um, i think in terms of you know lots of people are working together to deal with the problem um, i think that deadline remains the same what we have seen through the impact of, of COVID is we've changed some of the timelines around interim milestone UK. Um, those milestones uh, are there to help break the problem down, to help to move people across. Um, we have seen some markets move quicker than others. I think a great example in the sterling market is the um, is the bond market, the FRN markets, the Asian markets. These are markets that two years ago people were saying, oh, you know, it's very difficult to use Sonia. Uh, it's going to be very difficult to move across. Um, but actually, once the conventions were set, um, once people saw it could work, um, now, certainly in those markets in the UK, issuance is nearly entirely on Sonia and has moved away from LIBOR. Um, as I say, we've got good liquidity in the derivatives market. For those of you that use long dated derivatives, liquidity in Sonia is building and there are plans to move that across. Um, and we have milestones which we can come to um, around lending. These milestones are there to, to be helpful and make sure we have a smooth and measured transition and we can help move everyone through it without any breaks in access to uh, funding or financing um, and making sure that people can manage their costs as through this process and documentation and other concerns they may have. Okay. And uh, just before I turn to David and ask for a bit of an update on timelines in the US, is there somewhere that people can go and, and see what these timelines are? Is, are there, is there a, a Absolutely. So there's, so a huge, there's a huge... There is a huge amount of information out there. Um, we host the uh, UK Working Group's um, webpage, and that has a huge amount of information out there um, for all sorts of users, from those of you that want to read detailed papers about spread adjustments, through to those of you that want short bite-sized videos explaining some of the concepts. Um, the timelines are out there, um, and, uh, and they relate to lending, they relate to new business and legacy business. So we're going to touch on some of these issues as we move through all designed to kind of help people move through in a, in a smooth way. But the risk-free rate working group in the UK um, has milestones, as does uh, the art group in the US. But in the UK, they can be accessed via the Bank of England's website. That's great, Al. Thank you. And, and David, uh, timelines in the US, are, are they similar or very different to those that have been suggested in the UK? They are very similar. They're tailored to our market. Um, so as in the UK, the floating rate debt market, um, there is still labor issuance, but SOFR does predominate. Uh, 
And the ARC's best practice recommendation for floating rate debt issuance is no more LIBOR issuance by anyone um, after the end of this year. Uh, and uh, for loans, um, no new uh, LIBOR loans um, after June of 2021. So again, um, you know, the ARC has to, and everyone has to take uh, statements of SCA seriously that they need to prepare for the risk that LIBOR could stop as early as the end of 2021. Um, and so, you know, in the ARC's opinion, June is the, is a safe time. You don't want to just keep issuing LIBOR um, up, to, up to the very last day. Like Al, you know, here, uh, it's sort of like The Princess Bride. If people know that movie, you remember the person who would just keep saying inconceivable. And, you know, the, another character says, I don't think that word means what you think it means. And, uh, you know, like here, there's that, you know, inflating rate debt, you know, it was inconceivable that anyone could ever use an overnight rate and inflating rate debt. You know, just uh, nobody knew. But then you do the work and it's, if you're willing to do the work, you take three weeks, you figure it out and you can do it. Um, I hope the loan market will go that way too. You know, there are a lot of people that don't want to dip their toes in that water, um, but I think if you do dip your toes in the water, you're going to find it will work fine. Especially for non-financial corporates, I would really urge you to advocate for these things. If your banks aren't talking to you about it, then just uh, tell them that they need to talk to you about it or find some other bank that won't talk to you about it. <laughs> that's, uh, that's very helpful advice, actually, David. Thank you for that. I think corporates uh, will appreciate the candor. Um, so I think that's kind of touched on on new transactions. I don't know if there's anything else that when we're thinking about new transactions specifically, as opposed to legacy transactions, uh, is there anything else that you'd want to add to to that, Al? Or do you feel that we've probably talked? Uh, just 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 very quickly, uh, I'd say you know establishing those markets and alternatives is is really key to transition. It means we stop making the problem worse. Uh, by writing more libel link contracts and it also ensures we have deep and liquid markets to move people to and that ensures that you know you can all access the the funding and risk management products you need so in the uk actually uh, at the start of this month in october uh, uk banks should be actively offering alternatives in uh, in sterling uh, lending uh, and uh, and if we expect to see that product offering there so as david says if someone's offering you libel link products um then you know question why, especially if they're going beyond 2021. Okay, that, that's very helpful advice. Thank you very much indeed. Okay, so let's turn to the slightly, what I always think is the slightly knottier problem of legacy transactions. Um, how how do, does one go about thinking about moving those away from LIBOR perhaps? Um, Al, is there anything that sort of points or tips you could perhaps offer on, on legacy transactions and how one might think about those? Yeah, sure. Uh, certainly there, there's a lot of exposures out there. It'll be a, a big concern for many people who will have long dated financing and other products or people who've entered into transactions more recently that perhaps don't have um, adequate or robust fallbacks to move them away from LIBOR. The first thing I'd say is understand where LIBOR is used in your business. Um, um, it sounds obvious, but you know, LIBOR has been all pervasive. Um, so make sure you've got a good catalog um, of your, uh, and where it's used. Um, and then um, I'd say that start to speak to um, those, those people that provide you with those products, uh, uh, especially where they mature beyond 2021 and then start to engage with them. Um, in the UK, we've seen good examples of loans and bonds or FNRNs all convert from LIBOR. Um, now we appreciate those processes can be time consuming, but if you want economic certainty, um, that is the best move to go to, uh, um, to start to look at what's been done in the market. Um, there are these things called fallbacks and switch language, which we haven't had time to go in today, but there's a lot of work on standardizing the, um, the language and documentation. People like the LMA uh, have been working hard to reduce the costs around moving uh, legacy business. Um, in derivatives, there is a ready-made uh, solution that we have been working, and David's been working longer than me uh, on, with ISDA, um, which is which is a great solution that ISDA have worked hugely hard on to produce marketless to move derivatives across, um, uh, which I really encourage people to look at um, and sign up to if, if they do have uh, such exposures. And then lastly, in the UK, the UK government um, has announced its intention uh, to legislate, uh, to give the FCA greater powers to deal with what we refer to as the, the tough legacy, these transactions that really can't be moved. What I'd say is I wouldn't 
you know, it may be tempting to sort of re rely on on such a move. What I what I'd say is there are limitations to that. It is there as a as a seatbelt. Um, you shouldn't rely on it. Um, but it, it is good to know that there is kind of help there for those contracts that you really, really can't move, um, and that work is progressing as well. And David, is there anything that you'd add on, on legacy transactions in the US? Sure. So legacy transactions are the, you know, the most thorny problem here. Um, they are a financial stability risk um, because, you know, I, as Al said, I think most people have gone through their language um, and tried to understand what happens if LIBOR stops. If you haven't, you certainly should. You're probably not going to like what you see when you when you work through that, um, you know. And derivatives are a, a key example um, where you know if you first of all if you actually tried to find it in this, it would you have to sort through 200 pages to figure out what would happen if LIBOR stopped. But if you can find that the you know and write paragraphs, you'll see if LIBOR just stops and then your derivative today, it would tell your agent, um, so probably your dealer to call some banks in London or New York, doesn't say which banks, and ask them to quote your rate. Nobody thinks that you'll be quoted a rate. And then it's just simply silent, which means nobody will know what to pay or receive on those derivatives. You know, for corporates, you may have purchase agreements or sales agreements that reference LIBOR, probably don't say anything at all about what will happen um, if LIBOR stops. So this really is the key financial stability risk. Now, luckily for derivatives, as Al said, there is a solution, and that is to adhere to the used protocol, which hopefully will come out this month. And that's just crucial. Um, there are very few choices other than that. Um, if you don't adhere to the used protocol and LIBOR stops, you're going to court, uh, as far as I could see. Um, and it may take a very long time for you to figure out what will happen to those derivatives. And probably at the end of the day, you'll just get whatever it is said anyway, because that will be that is the market convention. If you're not going to adhere, then um, you should close out before LIBOR stops. And what I tell people is I would do both. I would adhere and close out. Um, you can try to renegotiate some of these bilaterally, but that that will be very challenging to do. So the ISDA protocol really is key. Uh, the word protocol sometimes has a bad reputation as being overly complicated, but this one is very simple and it really is in everyone's interest. All it does is it codifies, you know, the fallbacks that should have been there to begin with. Um, so that's crucial. Uh, you know, in the loan market here, we we have emphasized using hardwired fallback language now. And that means language that tells you now what will happen when LIBOR stops. Um, in the syndicated loan market up to this point, people have been using what we call amendment language, which means you know people will um, negotiate at the time LIBOR stops. It's fairly borrower friendly language. The borrower or their agent gets to propose a rate. But you know, if you have hundreds of thousands of syndicated loans out there, you don't want to have to be deciding them all at the same time or wondering, is someone in the syndicate on the lender side going to object and what do I do then? Um, so we are emphasizing that. Um, you know, we do have uh, other, other securities like floating rate debt here is harder to modify because it takes unanimous consent under US law. Uh, nonetheless, you know, some people have been trying to buy back some other debt, and I think that is worth trying. Um, you know, the benefits are large and the cost is not that high. But not all of that will be negotiated in the US. So the UK um, legislative powers, um, you know, it's very good. I'm glad that they have those tools. Um, they would work very well in the UK because they'd be codified under UK law. Um, but, you know, if you have a contract under U.S. law, um, you may, may still face legal challenge, even if, say, this solution, this U.K. solution were already be used for U.S. dollar because, you know, a U.S. court doesn't have to recognize FCA's right to, to make these changes. So, um, you know, for U.S. dollar uh, contracts under U.S. law, the ARC has been pro um, pursuing le a legislative solution here. Um, with the state of New York, although, you know, federal legislation could always be a possibility, uh, but most contracts in the U.S. are under, uh, LIBOR contracts are under U.S. law, and so that's where they've gone. Um, they have a clear proposal. You can find it on the ARC's website um, because of COVID. I mean, New York has not been in a normal legislative season. 
we're hoping that um, for the next year in January that this will be part of uh, the budget process and that we can come to a resolution fairly quickly. Okay, that's really great. That's a very helpful uh, insight into into what's going on in both the UK and, and the US. Um, I'm very aware that actually we're rapidly running short on time. So i just close with a, a question to each of you really, which is, and, and you can fight about who goes first, but really about what do you think, looking at the corporates who are the majority of the audience for this particular session, um, what do you think corporates should be doing now and in the next six months? Shall I start, David? Um, I'll go first, perhaps, sure. and then can you jump in? That's all right. Um, so, so I think, I mean, I'd, I'd like to certainly emphasise here that the, this is a, a team effort. It, it's not transition is not something that borrowers are doing, uh, lenders are doing to borrowers. So, I think you know, there's action for us all in there: governments, regulators, product providers, product users. So, certainly, I think the first thing to do is is to really think about moving from planning to execution. I'd say stop making the problem. So, I'd say. You know, if you're entering or refinancing uh, in period, uh, you know, I would I would enter libel link transactions with real care. Um, I would push hard against what are the alternatives, and if you do have to execute in libel, which clearly I think there are challenges around doing so, make sure you've got a clear transition mechanism in place that is going to get you away from libel um, before uh, the end of 2021. Um, otherwise, there's a huge amount of help out there. Um, for corporates, I say I've talked about the, the Bank of England website, which has uh, access to information on webinars, videos, written materials. We have a LinkedIn account. Um, you know, we're working hard to create market consensus and standardised documents, and working with standard setted bodies like the accountants. Some of you may worry about hedge accounting and other issues. Working to make sure relief is in place to create a smooth transition, but I do encourage people to engage. Uh, lastly, I'll just say I know people will be worried about the costs. Um, my colleagues at the FCA have produced, you know, quite clear guidance here, which they put out in the public domain that libel discontinuation should not be used um, to move customers with continuing contracts to replacement rates that are expected to be higher than libel or move them to inferior terms. Um, you can access more information on the FCA's website. Um, but a lot of help out there, but this none of this means that you do not need to engage. So I'd say. The key thing is, is you know, hopefully you're aware, but then start to engage, start to speak to your product, product providers, start to access the information and start to manage this as part of your overall kind of risks. Um, there is time and there is help. David, I would agree. To add? Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, you know, I think corporate treasurers always have a lot of things on their mind. You know, I'll say five, six months ago, obviously, we all had COVID on our minds. And 2021 may have still seemed far away. You might not have had very much debt that matured past that. You might have felt like, you know, this is still something that I can deal with a few months from now. But time is getting short. Um, this is not this is not costless. You do need to learn um, how to use these new rates. Um, you can use other rates too, but I think these need to be part of the mix, or I assume they will be part of the mix. They don't need to be. Um, and that takes learning and that takes, you know, making sure your budget's there um, uh, so you can make any operational changes that you need to. Um, what I've tried to emphasize for a long time, corporates oftentimes tell me, well, my bank's not talking to me. When I go in and ask about, you know, LIBOR, they'll tell me, well, it's not gonna stop. Um, uh, uh, or, you know, just keep using it. So I would really encourage people to be active participants in this, as I said before, if your bank is just trying to keep selling you LIBOR, then, you know, push back on them. And just uh, if they are offering what seem like impractical solutions, I would demand that they give you a practical solution. There's every reason, you know, that they can do that. That's correct. Thank you, David. So it sounds rather as if we should just say no to LIBOR. Um, <laughs> anyway. We've, we've, we've come to the end of our time, so I'd just like to thank you both very much indeed. That's been a really interesting and informative session. Just, it's so helpful to get the perspective of the official sector in what is such a large and complex exercise that's happening around the world. Um, so we have more sessions during this week, specifically on LIBOR transition. Um, 
and I'm aware that there are also many other hot topics such as ESG, risk management, coronavirus and how one might respond to the crisis and many of these are also covered this week during conference so please do take a look at the agenda and I hope you'll watch other parts of the programme either live or on demand. Um, I'd just like to say thank you finally to um, Alistair and to David and to please remind everybody to take the opportunity to fill in the survey that accompanies this recording. Um, finally, thank you very much indeed, gentlemen. Uh, goodbye and enjoy the rest of the conference.